Hello and welcome everyone to the Shishmid webinar, How to Measure and Improve Your Patient Attraction and Retention Growth Strategies, Part 2, Baptist Health Jacksonville Case Study. Shishmid would like to extend a sincere thank you to HSG for sponsoring today's webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. First off, this webinar is now being recorded and is broadcast in listen-only mode. We welcome your comments and questions throughout the presentation. Click the Q&A icon in the lower right-hand side of your screen to, answer your question, or to enter your questions or comments, as we have a lot of time at the end for Q&A. If you prefer to use the chat, please select all panelists to direct your questions to the speakers. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. DJ Sullivan is a director for HSG Advisors, a national healthcare consultancy that takes a comprehensive data-driven approach to working with hospitals and health systems to build differentiated strategies that are customized to their market needs. Max Hubel is the executive director of budget, financial planning, and reporting for the Baptist Health Jacksonville system, a five hospital system with over $2.4 billion in net patient revenues and a double A stable standard and pores rating. Chad Reese is the Director of Planning and Marketing for the Baptist Health Jacksonville System, the Jacksonville, Florida area's largest and most preferred health system with over 1,600 medical staff physicians, five hospitals currently operating, and a six opening in late 2022. DJ Max and Chad, the floor is now yours. Thanks for the introduction, Tom, and uh, I want to personally thank Max and Chad both for their willingness to participate and joining with us today. So we'll give brief introductions, but if you're here for many of you, I know probably participated and joined for our first session uh, about two weeks ago, where we kind of walked through the theory and the thoughts behind uh, what we uh, at HSG believe to be some best practices for building patient attraction and retention growth strategies. Today, we're gonna to focus a lot on the implementation aspect of that and talk through some examples of how Baptist Health has specifically been able to do that successfully. Quickly, uh, overview of myself, director, as was mentioned with HSG, been with the firm for nine, 10 years now, very focused on the organizational aspect of the growth aspect and network integrity uh, components of partnering with health systems across the country. Max and Chad. Good afternoon. I'm Max Hubel, the Executive Director of Budget and Financial Planning for Baptist Health. Um, been with the health system for a little over seven years and really use this data today that we're going to present kind of to help drive our budgets and our planning for future growth. So, awesome opportunity and introduce Chad. Good day, everyone. I am Chad Reese, the Director of Planning and Marketing for Baptist Health. I have been with the health system approaching 29 years this summer. Um, and in our role, our department, we focus mainly on market research, which is going to be a large part of what we discussed today, um, as well as strategy, another component of today's discussion. Perfect, thanks guys. So quick overview for those that don't know us at HSG, uh, healthcare consultancy, have worked kind of in five core service areas as we've been partners with Baptist Health for three plus years now in some certain areas, mainly around physician strategy and network integrity. So really kind of more comprehensive medical staff development planning, getting into patient share of care, kind of revenue-based KPI development for the organization. And we're grateful for the partnership we've been able to develop with them over the past number of years. And now a, a quick overview of Baptist Health. And the first thing I'll say is that while we share the name, we have no formal relationship with the Baptist of Miami and the Baptist of Pensacola. Um, but Baptist Health in Jacksonville, located in Northeast Florida, um, sometimes called the First Coast, um, is the area's largest health system. Um, we do have six hosp five hospitals with the sixth hospital opening later this year, um, 13,000 employees, and that does include um, almost 500 employed physicians. Um, some signature services are Wilson Children's Hospital, the Baptist MD Anderson Cancer Center, um, and Baptist Heart Hospital. And overall, the system has revenues just over 2.4 billion. Fantastic, thanks. Thanks, Chad. Anything else uh, that needs to be added, Max? Perfect. So, where are we going? going? Yep, just go ahead. Here's one. In this market, it's a, I refer to it as a market of big brands. We have the Mayo Clinic, the University of Florida, Ascension, um, HCA Hospitals, and, and Baptist. Yeah, great, great, yeah, great points to add there, Chad. 
regarding your market dynamics. So two additional housekeeping things we'll touch on before we hop into everything, that if there are specifics around one, if you would like uh, components of this presentation to share with your team um, after today's recording, um, please reach out. There's gonna be a post webinar survey. If you complete the details within that, we'll make sure that you have PDF components of that as well as uh, an accompanying white paper that dives into share of care specifically in a bit more detail, as well as the session two weeks ago. If you did miss that, you have the ability to access that uh, via the link at the bottom of the page. So just additional resources that are available to you if it's a, something that you're interested in learning about in more depth. And then thinking about where we're going today. So a lot of the structure of how we've kind of put the content together is thinking through what did we talk through a few weeks ago, but then how do we make sure that it's applicable to uh, one Baptist Health and how they applied a lot of these specific things. So we're going to keep the structure relatively consistent with what we uh, started with a few weeks back, but mainly focusing more on the application side of things around how do we develop growth strategies, how to make sure that we have the right KPIs for our organization. How do we manage and communicate those key APIs effectively? And then kind of focus on some of the you know, big conclusions, takeaways, best practices, some of those aspects of things that I think was alluded at the very beginning, trying to leave the last 15 or so minutes for some Q&A from the audience. So where we'll go is a quick recap is one, the problem statement of really, why are we here and why do we think this is something that needs to be focused on in more depth? So we as HSG, a national consultancy, do annual surveys. And one in, uh, we did in mid-2021 was around the utilization of data and, and how organizations are using that from a growth strategy development standpoint. Results of that from health systems we received all over the country was more or less one in every three health systems felt that they were not effectively utilizing the data that they did have. You layer that in with trying to develop competing growth strategic priorities in living in a fee for volume world, living in a fee for value world, where they, some are focused on fee for volume. How do we get more patients into our doors? Fee for value, how do we optimize the care that those patients that are in our doors are receiving? So trying to understand one, we don't feel like we have the right data or are utilizing the data appropriately. We're trying to build strategies that can balance those multiple worlds. It just creates an issue that we need to have a solution for. Similarly, as you flow to, oh, go ahead. You have a comment, Chad? No, please continue. No, yeah, please. Uh, so uh, um, in one second, for the second component of this that we did as it relates to um, the Mar March 9th session, we did a couple webinar poll results from that audience that was specific to one, do you feel you uh, have the right KPI for measuring your growth strategy as an organization? About a third of the respondents said they're using only inpatient market share. One in five said, no, we don't really have any metric we're using to understand our growth objectives and if we're achieving those. We then want to understand how effectively are those KPIs actually measuring the success of the growth. That audience telling us that it was kind of a standardized bell curve 10% not effectively, you know, that data is not effective at all. 3% saying, yeah, we're the, are the KPIs we have developed are doing a great job of helping us focus on where we need to get specifically. But, you know, the remainder, the 85% remainder, really kind of undecided on if their KPIs are effective for their organization or not, which is, you know, somewhat concerning. And then last piece getting into do, and almost most specifically, do organizations feel they have the right data to make decisions off of. And as you can see, 70% strongly disagreed to almost neutral on if they even feel like they have the right data flowing into their systems to actually then make decisions off of. So TJ, what I would add is that we fall into that one third bucket of using the Florida Agency for Healthcare Administration um, inpatient data for market share. In Florida, we also have some outpatient surgery data that we're able to pull in. But then we're also in that 37% of the top of saying that, you know, the concept is we think we need something broader um, to give us more insight into the market because we know it's so much, it's about so much more than hospitals. Yep, love that. And that, that's definitely, yeah, something consistently we're hearing all over the place. So where, uh, quick recap, so taking those data inputs, there are kind of two separate ways as we think about building a specific strategy for our organization, growth strategy specifically, we need to understand how do we, one, attract more patients into our systems. And you can see across the bottom, we have 
all sorts of potential data inputs that go into making strategic decisions off of whether it be provider need, referral source alignment, traditional market share, whatever it may be. But we find that really those patient attraction strategies need to be very focused on markets, uh, geographies, and or specific service lines, kind of being the core things that are driving our ability and our capabilities to attract more patients into our systems. Conversely, if we think about retention strategies, so these are patients that are entering our sites of care already, how do we optimize our retention of those patients? One, from just a care optimization standpoint, a, a general patient retention standpoint, where that needs to be more focused on how are those patients actually entering into our systems? So whether it be our primary care patient populations, we understand that patients being seen by one of the PCPs that is either employed or affiliated with, it, with us in some way, how do we ensure that those patients are, those primary care patients are receiving as much of their service offering at our other sites of care as possible. And, you know, as that could differentiate, whether that be inpatient sites of care, urgent immediate care, as you kind of think about those three cohorts where primary care patients, probably the most loyal to your organization is what we see from a data standpoint. The inpatient ED patients, probably the least loyal of those cohorts. And then the urgent immediate care being the ones where there's probably the biggest variation and the biggest education opportunity piece that may exist to optimize our ability to retain those patients within our system. So taking those two aspects of thinking about attraction and retention strategies and, and how that needs to flow, I guess I'll let Max and Chad kind of talk through how they as Baptist Health kind of got to their growth for the future standpoint, thinking about where they want to get to as an organization. Yes, CJ. So, in terms of acquisition and retention globally, we um, that falls under our growth for the future strategic pillar. It's one of five pillars in the health system that guides our strategy. Um, and there, it's sort of the overall goal is to expand our reach aligned with tomorrow's healthcare environment. And so, that's a clear recognition uh, that healthcare is shifting into more ambulatory settings. It has, it's already there, and it, the shift is, is happening even more. And so we want to make sure that we're able to measure not just our footprint or our position uh, in the hospital side, but in that overall market. Um, and so that led us to this, uh, what we now call the share of care measurement. Um, and you will also see there, we have a destination goal to achieve a 34% share of care um, over a three year period in this initial plan. But Max, do you want to walk through how we sort of describe and break up the share of care buckets? Sure. And and to a point DJ pointed out earlier too is to have the right data was key. Um, we were originally only using inpatient or hospital facility based net revenues as our share of care, and we thought we were at 34 percent already. Once we were able to see the entire market, our goal had to go down from originally 50% to 34, because once we got the global market, we realized the market's more of an $8 billion or market. So, um, but what we did was really simplify our growth for the future and say, Y equals a function of X. Share of care is driven by six main buckets, front door strategy, ambulatory strategy, specialty strategy, new business, secondary market, and payer. And as long as we focus key on all of these services, we can drive our share of care up. And what HSG has really been able to give us is the data to see and track, are we really growing our share of care? Most of those flowing through the front doors or specialties, but doing those other um, focus areas to help drive up those, those net revenues. So awesome, easy, easy Y equals a function of X strategy and moving forward with it, thanks to the help of the data. Yeah, I love that. And so getting into some of the specifics of that in a little bit more depth is one. Now we understand the share of care is that KPI that Baptist Health, you guys have kind of decided that's where we need to focus on organizationally. So there were probably two components to that as one. How do we define and measure that in an appropriate way? And so the things that made sense or what we see uh, traditionally is one. How do we understand? Um, I guess all the different data inputs that we commonly see. So there's a whole list of things that as we interact and partner with clients across the country that we hear all the time where I think some of what's already alluded to, we're using just our inpatient uh, data through the state. We're trying to utilize just our internal EMR. Um, we're using just anecdotes from what we're hearing from physicians and other providers in the market on what we think is happening. And so trying to take all those different things and say, 
how do we actually understand and tie all those pieces together where we start with what we commonly see is optimization of utilizing one data source to lead will lead to the fewest gaps and actually developing that comprehensive strategy so that's where we've been able to obviously partner with that just tell specifically is let's bring all those pieces together using the claims based approach uh, kind of um, provided in the bottom here where it is, you know, what we feel to be the most holistic portrait of what that patient care looks like from an inpatient outpatient physician office point of view and trying to understand all those facility entrance points. Um, and then how do we optimize what our capture is within that market? So what Max already said, you know, there was maybe some glaring holes on what that overall market size actually was. So being able to strategically put together and comprehensively understand that and then build our strategy to support where we need to go. And so the one part I'll take a quick step back on uh, as it relates to the patient attraction piece was what share of care is. And so I know a lot of organizations um, have not always traditionally used a revenue based metric uh, for understanding like spend of patients within their markets. And so really share of care is share of wallet from other industries applied to healthcare, which is overall just helping us try to understand how much of that total healthcare dollar that patients are spending in a certain market or geography, what is our capture of that? So if you kind of look at the two pillars here on the left-hand side would be probably a traditional inpatient uh, market share view, where maybe we have our hospital A, B and or other hospitals um, what, what does that capture look like? Or maybe we're saying we're capturing 40% of the inpatient share in our market. But as you translate that to a revenue based figure on the right hand side, what you might actually find is that once we take into account, not just the inpatient component, but the outpatient component, physician offices, other ancillary services, et cetera, that we actually might be capturing a lot higher percentage of that from a revenue standpoint, because we have joint replacements that we're doing at a much higher rate than just the physician office visits and whatever it may be for your organization. And so it, depending on the organization and your structure, it can drastically um, impact the way in which your organization kind of views the world and the markets in which you're working in. Anything to add to that, Max or Chad? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add that we're, we're not here to go after the dollars and trying to grow the dollars and say, put more people in the facilities. What we're really trying to do, is, as DJ is saying, is look at the overall market and say, can we shift revenues from other companies into our company? So it's not, hey, we're just going to keep forcing people in. It's how do we shift share from one other location to our facilities? So that was a big learning curve that we had to get past going from units to, to dollars. But once you get past that point, people are on board and it's the quick shift and then moving forward. And I'll add that culturally that it, it shifted our results. And Max already alluded to the having to adjust the goal. Um, using our inpatient share, that's really driven through the health system as to where we were. Well, now when we've gone to this broader definition, and that's also based on revenue, it's not as high as it was. And so that's a little bit of a cultural shock um, that you're sort of recalibrating where you are. Um, so, so that was one thing that we discovered as well. And, and that's one thing I'll echo too, Chad, that we see everywhere is that that transition from well, our inpatient share has always been 70%. How are we only capturing 40% of the you know, total market spend? And it's taking into account all that outpatient component, physician office component, other things where that education piece is definitely a huge hurdle that we see kind of across the board. So maybe as it uh, relates to, I guess, some of the specific aspects of things that have been built um, for you as internal KPI metrics, you guys wanna spend a little bit of time talking through these? Sure, so we're gonna go through a few different reports that DJ and his team are able to produce for us and kind of why they're important for what we're doing today. But the first report is talking about total overall share of care. So when we look at the health system KPI in total, this is the metric that's driving it. And the great thing is you can quickly see where you perform quarter one, quarter two, even as revenues grow because of inflation, you're still seeing that you're not really growing, you're, you're trending in the same direction. So quick, easy report for the executive team to look at and say, okay, how are we looking by quarter? And then how are we looking by payer? So obviously right now, commercial makes us more money. Um, government, you want to kind of keep out of the facility. So there's two different structures, DJ said. 
So we can quickly see, okay, are we performing well on the commercial side? Are we, how are we performing on the government side? So high level, quick report. But then as we want to drill down into it, we're actually able to start seeing data by side of care. So, okay, I thought I was doing really well. I'm 34% of the market, but no, I'm 34% of the hospital inpatient and outpatient market. You can easily see there's areas of opportunity to go after other locations. So even though ambulatory healthcare facilities, physician offices and all other access points seem to be smaller, the percentage of share that we have in those areas were smaller. So quick opportunity to, to expand to those areas and quickly grow share. But it's good to see that what you're probably looking at today could be expanded even into a fuller market picture. And this helps show our company, you know, where else should we go and, and attack? The next yeah, piece. Oh, go ahead. Well, that's what I said. Yes, it's, it's given us that insight into those other areas of the market. So we begin to understand how big they are, how much revenue is associated with that. Um, and, and again, that shows us where there may be opportunities that we had not thought of. And, and I would also say on the previous slide, our market's been pretty slow to do the ambulatory shift. So other markets, I'm sure, see that bucket being a lot larger. But where we are currently, it's a slow transition. And I mean, obviously, we're going to ride the hospital as long as we can. But you'll, we'll start to expect those bar graphs to go longer while the inpatient ones start to get shorter. So, um, But quick, great, easy access to see where the actual side of care is. And then what we really want to do is we understand that service lines are going to be the main drivers of share of care. So there's different points of the patient's visit, but the service line is going to wrap up the entire uh, share of care for that patient visit. And we focus on key service lines, including the ones highlighted, and put service line leaders in place over these to say, okay, now you're being held accountable to grow that. And how are you growing? And we can quickly see by service line, are we trending better or worse compared to the prior pool by payer, um, so you obviously growing commercial government, we're, we're trying to get keep down. So uh, great work here, but then you say, okay, well, you know, what makes up cardiovascular? What's inside of general surgery? What do I want to drill into more detail and see if, if we have that? And luckily DJ's team was able to produce that as well. So we can go in here and see share of care by subservice line and say, okay, you know, medical cardiology makes up the most, but we're not performing very well in EPs and we could quickly still share our oh, we thought we were doing good in cath, but that business is so small, why don't we focus in cardiac surgery? So we can quickly see subservice lines that we can grow, and then we can track and trend and say, okay, are these people actually performing to the plans that they're putting in place? So key information, um, real high-level views that people can easily take, digest, read, and then actually put in action plans, put action plans into place. And one thing about this process, just for background, is that we did make sure that these definitions aligned with the historic definitions that we would used on the inpatient share for that consistency. And so we have those mirrored. And if I, if there's two things I might add too, and you guys can uh, correct me if I'm off on uh, aspects of where our discussions have been historically, but I think the two key components was we start to look at things from a facility and side of service aspect is one that physician office ambulatory market, the robustness that existed there that maybe wasn't entirely in our grasp, as well as then looking at, like for this example, uh, maybe outpatient cardiac diagnostics. When we start to layer that into um, all of our separate service lines, understanding the relative dollar value is not going to be as significant for all of those outpatient services. But we can, you know, quickly start to pinpoint that small percentage points there, depending on where we're trying to go from a revenue growth standpoint and patient attraction standpoint, that there's, you know, probably potentially some low hanging fruit that most likely exists that wasn't really on our radar previously. Absolutely. I, it does. It gives us those opportunities. And, you know, we've been in that space. But again, like I had said earlier, we really didn't understand our position or where we were. And so then it's helped us, one, understand where we are, but understand what the opportunity is. Yeah. So all of this so far has been focused on that patient attraction piece. So this is going to be, everything's been focused on, you know, markets, geographies. This is all patients residing in a five county, six county service area. What's the total spend for that patient population? How is our capture evolving over time? And what's our ability to incremental, uh, capture incremental revenue from that specific patient population? 
The second component uh, that, that we've talked through specifically is around the patient retention KPIs. And I believe the terminology used internally is in-network capture um, within Baptist Health, where we're able really to understand specifically flow of patients from our employed primary care to our employed specialists, where we're very focused on what does that look like over time, where maybe starting on the left-hand side of the visual here, where maybe we had patient is seen within our primary care practice, within a 90-day time frame, 46% of that volume in Q1 was going to a general surgeon that is employed by our, uh, by our facility, by our organization. And then obviously understanding how is that trending positively or negatively over time, and then being able to compare um, organizations one to another, um, I mean, service uh, lines and specialties one to another to understand where those opportunities may exist with really the focus on how do we optimize our ability to keep that patient volume within the system from primary care to specialty care services. That's right, DJ, because obviously it, it's easier to, to keep the business you already have than to acquire or shift from others. So that's one of our first objectives in, in measuring our in-network capture, seeing, look, counting those referrals and, and seeing where they go to make sure they, they stay in the system. If we'll go to the next slide, I think probably even more than just looking at it at a service line, it's really to start looking at it by office and by physician and tracking their um, referral rates. And so this information is very helpful. Our business development team can use this to uh, identify problems or, or where there are issues and then go have conversations and to understand what those are um, and to remove those obstacles to, to keep the, you know, the patients within the system. It also helps us with other things. It starts to indicate maybe there's an access problem that they're having a difficulty referring um, patients into a, a given specialist. Um, and so then that starts to tell us that we need to look at additional recruiting. So there's a lot of signals there, but it does help us keep that, um, those patients in the system. And as earlier, then we're trying to grow new patients as well. Yep. So after we've, I guess, kind of identified and developed our ability to measure these KPIs, it really gets into one, that management and communication piece. And so as we transition a little bit, so we've kind of won, uh, for those that weren't on the session a few weeks ago, kind of went back through, we've kind of developed the ability to measure. So we created some current state benchmarks. We wanna understand how are those KPIs trending over time? Begin to, as Chad just alluded to, where can we start to identify critical issues uh, that our team can address? And so now we're transitioning to the management component. We're really trying to understand how do we um, you know, optimize reporting for different stakeholders within the organization. How do we uh, begin to engage our providers in root cause discussions on, you know, what are opportunities for improvement and kind of dig into some of those uh, specific areas. And so really ultimately with the intention just to repeat is to create a repeatable system that keeps our organization focused on for Baptist Health uh, specifics growth for the future. And what does that look like and how do we make sure that that you know nugget that we've put out there that's our long-term goal how do we continue to have that be the focus of where we're trying to go organizationally sure so so what you're going to see is the process that Baptist health took and what we really started to do is sat down with the cfo and co and said okay what do we want how do we want to cascade that 34 percent down by front door strategy so adding heads providers etc or by service line, adding top line dollars. And you know, the providers are gonna feed into the service lines as they drive the business. So what we did is we looked at historical increases year over year and said, okay, this service line grew by X amount of percent. Let's apply that and see if this gets us to our goal. By adding a certain number of doctors and by adding this, a certain number of dollars, we were actually able to achieve that 34% in three years from a minimum and a maximum standpoint. So we were going after 34, uh, a certain minimum percentage and a certain maximum percentage. After we sat down, put that, put those goals into place, we went and met with the strategy team that included key leadership and service line leadership to say, hey, here's the goals that we came up with. Do you guys think these are these are reasonable? We wanted to get their buy-in because once you have their buy-in, then you're like, okay, it's game time, let's go. So met with the CEO or CFO, COO, then down to the strategy group. And then Chad's gonna kind of talk about how we actually push these plans out. And I think what is very important about what Max was sharing there is that um, those executives are also looking to create a little bit more of a stretch goal 
um, than maybe we would normally accept if we were creating our own goals for our own service. But once those have been established, there is a, a conversation with the service line leadership and, and an agreement that, okay, in three years, this is where we expect to be. And with that agreement, then the ownership really does fall to the service lines to come back and, and develop plans um, to show how they are going to, to reach their goal. And then they will bring that plan back to the strategy group to basically accept it, endorse it. And then, as Max said, we're off and running. And then they do come back periodically for um, check-ins. And so if we move to the next slide, a little more detail on the process. As I've already said, that executive leadership group is really setting the stretch goals. It's the service line leaders that own the development of the plan to meet those goals. And obviously they're going to need some help with that. And so, you know, we've been talking about top line revenue, but we know that um, it, what's also important is the operating margin. And that's where Max and his group comes in and working with the service lines to help them understand uh, where they have their best margins, but it's also might be where there are opportunities to address cost structure to improve the margin. From the marketing side and the planning side, we then are looking at the market simultaneously to say, okay, here's where we are, there's opportunity to shift share, or here's where we're expecting to see a lot of growth. Um, maybe simple things such as the aging of the population, increasing the need for EP ablations. And so then we pull all that together, working with service line leaders to go ahead and create those very specific tactics on what they're looking to grow to meet those revenue targets. And then at that point, we work with the marketing side and we essentially hand off you know, what our targets are and start talking to them about this is the type of patient you're looking for, this is the type of consumer, um, and, and here's ways that you might be able to find them. So it all does come together. Um, many parts are working, but again, the overall ownership towards meeting those service line goals or even the front door goals falls to the leadership of those individual areas. The, and Chad, I might say two things. So for those that don't recall from or weren't involved a few weeks back that this, uh, I guess, communication drill down piece where the budget finance, service line leadership, these being very specific things to what Baptist Health has found to be kind of best practice for their use internally based on their structure. That doesn't mean that for your organization it has to match this perfectly, but I think understanding the specifics of, you know, your reporting mechanism and your organizational structure, the measurement and reporting of that data should fit into those appropriate and be fed to those stakeholders in the appropriate manner. And then the second part I might ask if you're willing to chat, elaborate on a little bit is when you talk about, I guess, that data feeding back to the marketing aspect and what some of those tactics are. I saw a question come in. Are there some specific tactics that you guys have kind of utilized from the data perspective that's kind of fed how you've actually gone out uh, from a tactical point of view uh, to support some of the service lines? You know, the, the response is, is that once we've identified, say, let's say a procedure, um, we then start understanding who those patients are that are seeking those procedures. Um, and then that marketing team is going to work and say, okay, what are the, the vehicles? What are the avenues, the media that is the best way to approach these consumers? And we do have also a, a consumer testing group where we can test concepts to say, okay, does this resonate? Um, so, yeah, we're, we're taking a lot of different action, though, to go after very, I think what's key is that we identified very specific targets, again, procedures, and we go after those very specifically. And sometimes we've, we've learned, our, our marketing teams learned, you know what, this oddly is radio during drive time, or and here's one that's going to be more digital-based advertising. Um, but again, because I think we've narrowed down specifically what we're looking for and who we're looking for, that helps them create that that their marketing campaigns. Yeah, and so one, one, I love to hear how you guys are using it. One other thing I've heard just to respond back to the question as it came in that we've seen from some other organizations is have it be very, uh, have the data uh, that's whether it be share of care based, uh, you know, in network capture based, you can quickly identify geographically where some of the greater gaps are and do, you know, we've seen like some geo advertising, things like that, where you can identify more specifically that maybe there's a specific patient population where orthopedics is a lot higher, you know, leakage opportunity compared to other geographies that we might be serving. So sometimes it's just a, you know, it's the education standpoint around those patients, but then you can probably get a little bit more strategic around the actual geographies in which those patients reside and utilize their care 
um, that might impact that as well. Yes, and that's where we do still go back to the traditional data sources um, okay. using the, the Florida ACA data. Um, we can then look at that by geography, by zip code, and understand our penetration in different markets for this target procedure. Um, and then we're going to evaluate, do we have the right um, front doors? Are we pulling the patients in, or do we have access in those areas to the specialists that they need? Um, and, and then that, yes, that helps us in terms of targeting. So we still use that, those historical or legacy um, data sources as well. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's great insight. So the other piece that I guess we want to kind of touch on from now, how do we make sure that once we have what we think is a general reporting structure that's optimized to actually communicate our KPIs throughout the organization, one thing we see all the time from a third party point of view is how do we make sure that providers are engaged in the actual you know, analysis that's coming to them in the reporting so that they can understand. Because what we typically find is that a lot of, especially if you think about in-network capture as an example, a lot of providers from what we see don't actually know that a third of their patients are potentially going outside of our network for their services. And so sometimes it's just an education piece on where, where are those patients actually going for their subsequent services. But so engaging those providers in those discussions and having it be very focused on what we see come about most frequently is there's most likely patient factors and or provider factors. So patient factors can be just general provider reputation, uh, travel time, as uh, Chad alluded to a minute ago. Uh, maybe there's insurance issues on why patients are selecting certain sites of care over others. Or there's also going to be provider factors, which can be just, you know, new relationships in the market. Uh, I went uh, to school with Dr. X 30 years ago, that he's who I'm, you know, he's who I trust the most, whether it's in network or not. So a lot of those different things just need to be taken into context when you're one, measuring the data, but then helping to manage and achieve organizational growth targets, that a lot of those factors, we just like to make sure that they're discussed and thought about throughout the organization um, and, you know, incorporated into kind of support where the data is and where we're trying to go. What I'll add is that I think it, the market is talking. It's telling you, it's sending you signals. It's sort of that uh, art of listening. You, you've got to go out and find the data sources um, to, to, to pick up those signals. But I think what's even more important is that, uh, for the lack of a better term, that dialogue, having is sharing, being um, very open and transparent and working with the clinical teams and, and sharing them what we know from a market perspective so they can align that with what they know from the practice perspective to really help us understand what's going on in the market, um, what the opportunities are, what may be some of the obstacles, you know, things that we need to address. And so like on the, the list you were showing, you can take with the, um, the in-network capture and the business development team, they're tracking that, that data and it's going to, when there's something unusual or it's not as expected, it's going to trigger a conversation to try to understand what's going on so that we can solve that problem. But again, I think it's all about um, transparency um, and, and sharing what we know and having conversations and then trying to decide how we go about attacking it. Anything to add? Based on this, Max? I think Chad was actually going to speak to kind of what we do, but this will also answer Michelle's second question. So, Chad, I don't know if you want to go back to this. Sure. I mean, you know, this is, again, just it's that whole concept of, of working with the teams. I do think what's interesting is in the lower right corner there is we have a very simple way to look and say, how are you, how's your service line performing in the market, first, second, or third? Um, and, and giving us an, you know, an idea of where those are. But then again, we're tracking over time how they're progressing. Um, so that second question was uh, that Max alluded to was how do you measure in, your in-network capture? And so at the moment, we are doing it based, they track the referrals that come out of the primary care offices by physician and, and they track where those referrals go. There are opportunities for us to do that better and to do it more efficiently. And I think if you, or if you really start to think about it, it's sort of going back to where we were at the beginning of inpatient discharges. One discharge equals one discharge. Whereas when you start looking at it by revenue, they may be different. So there could be opportunities, or I do think there are opportunities to start looking at that in-network capture um, by the revenue, if you can track that revenue that's flowing through um, those patient referrals. But at the moment, it is um, tracking 
where the you know, each referral from an office goes. And one thing I might add to that too, Chad, obviously from our perspective on really how do we make sure that we have a KPI that we feel is beneficial for the organization throughout where, you know, sometimes using an external source like you're using for share of care to understand and see that flow of patients, especially when you're utilizing your EMR internally, we see a lot of organizations struggle with the ability to capture what's actually going outside of the network. Um, and so being able to um, maybe use a third party source to support that might be something, Michelle, that we see a lot of organizations doing um, to help support that and kind of build some of those KPIs, depending on what your organization looks like and where it is you're trying to go. So the last piece is we kind of, uh, before we get to Q&A, where we want to kind of wrap up and then ideally leave, you know, 15 or so minutes for questions as they, as they arise, um, is really focused on, one, making sure that we have KPIs that are really focused on our core strategic growth initiatives, and I'll let Max and Chad talk about the, their uh, experiences specifically, but then making sure that we're engaging team members and actually developing those KPIs is what we feel is critically important. And lastly, building that communication structure um, to be able to have many, measure those and then have um, the right organizational cohorts receiving the right levels of information on a regular basis. So if we think back to some of the, you know, separate visuals that Max talked through where some were very executive level focused, some were very service line focused, some more focused on just the budgetary aspect for budget finance, where each stakeholder group, obviously within an organization, has separate takeaways they need to have from specific reporting KPIs. And so how do we make sure that those are specific to each of those stakeholders kind of on the front end? So then it's just a feeder system, a push system, not a pull system. Right. And and I'd say one of the most important things was to make sure that you actually engage the team. So it's it's easy to go ahead and create a strategy. But without the team's buy-in, we're not going to ever move forward with the strategy itself. So we know where the CEO, CEO, CFO's direction is, but without having your team underneath you buying in, then it's not going to move forward. So it did take a little bit of time to go from setting that goal to actually getting the buy-in. But once you get that buy-in, we're able at that point to come back, give every team member visuals into how they're performing, and then continue to engage them to keep moving towards the right goal. So um, we have you know, quarterly pools coming through, we're sharing the data with everybody, nothing's being hidden. So you could be the lowest level or the highest level and you're still getting this data and it makes everybody feel like they're on the same team and for the same direction. And then it really does help me from a budget financial planning standpoint, kind of forecast better in the future where we think we're gonna actually be. So, but engagement is key for sure. And I'll add, I'll echo you in terms of the transparency. We don't have yeah. secrets. Yeah, not, not having secrets is a good thing. So, any, I guess, last words from Max or Chad? Not for me. Okay, so no. with that, I guess uh, we, we can transition to if there are questions, if people want to send those in, and then I know uh, there, there might be a few that I haven't been able to track it perfectly, but if there's any that have come in, Max or Chad, that you have seen uh, while we've been going through, um, please uh, be willing to just hop in and kind of address them as needed. Absolutely. I think, Max, this question is for you. Um, were you measuring only inpatient revenue prior to the share of care model? I know there's some financial reports from ACA that was giving us some hostile perspective, but you're better to speak to that. Sure. So we were actually going out and buying audited statements for the main hospitals in our area, so the um, few that Chad presented earlier. And we were only going after those six. So once you start to actually look at the share of care, you start to get, you know, rehab hospitals, you start to get uh, freestanding imaging locations, freestanding surgery centers. So when we were originally planning, we were only using the major competitors, which brought us to about a $6 billion market. And then once we added in those other aspects, then we were able to get to the $8 billion market. So it was almost, yeah, just more facility inpatient driven. I mean, obviously inventory services, but not those smaller facilities that we're seeing the, the market start to shift to more recently. And Max, here's another question with you, or for you. Um, what were the greatest optical obstacles in finding appropriate data? And I go back to, we were having conversations about healthcare spend, um, and, and then we found this opportunity, but 
you went through a very detailed process of, of making sure the data matched the market or that was accurate so that when we took it out, it was defensible. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. So um, we have a payer in Jacksonville that kind of likes to hide their data from everybody. So we really continue to see holes. And a lot of our patients use that insurance company. So we continued to, every time we got a data source, we'd validate it against our numbers and say, hey, do they have this information or not? And we went through consultant after consultant. We probably interviewed eight to 10. And HSG was really the only one that was able to deliver the full market. It matched directly to our, um, our financials. When we pulled the other financials, we were getting the same data points. So it, it was nice. It was, it was a long, very hard process to finally get to the right um, company, but luckily DJ brought that to us. But um, it, people don't like it, and it, as this says, what's the ex external source? So we are pulling through payer claims. I don't know if DJ wants to speak to that, but there are payers or clearinghouses that don't want to share the data unless you pay for it. And um, we were constantly running into clearinghouses. Our, our main clearinghouse was not used by anybody else for some reason. So uh, a lot of work, but luckily DJ has access. All eyes open to that one. I mean, I don't know, DJ, if you want to speak to what your actual external, it says, what is the external source for your share of care? All payer claims? Yeah, so yeah, exactly. And th th thanks for one, some of that feedback, Max. And then uh, I honestly didn't even know some of that process had happened. So that's always nice to be a little bit validated. But two, uh, and a question I think around uh, to answer that in two ways uh, with the second component being, I think someone asked around seeing other PCPs in the market and patients that are utilizing care with those patients where when uh, so using external claims data that is focused on all payers um, and then as well as um, utilizing fee for service Medicare data um, and kind of aggregating those two patient sets together where we feel we have a comprehensive view of how patients are flowing throughout the ambulatory environment. Um, and so there's a couple different data sets that feed into that. But once we kind of are able to aggregate that data together um, and, and have it be a more cohesive way, then we're able to, one, understand um, how patients flow throughout the entire market that we're understanding, not just those associated with us specifically. So, because we see a lot of organizations try to perform similar analyses utilizing maybe ACO data, um, just their internal EMR. Uh, other metrics like that, but I think where the, where the question was alluding to that there's just gaps that exist from doing so, where you have a limited scope of, of patients that probably live within that data set. Sometimes it's robust enough, depending on the market, to make strategic decisions off of. We have found uh, that typically it is not. And so being able to be very specific around what market are we looking at, let's go through the data validation process that Max and his team have gone through to say, is it a representative uh, representative, you know, sample of what our market looks like? Because claims data is never going to be perfect. And uh, the last thing I want you to take away is that ours is perfect. Um, it, it's never going to be perfect, but there are some that are better than others. And so being able to, you know, do some of that data validation and then take a comprehensive view uh, to how that data actually um, is utilized within our system and how those patients flow throughout inpatient, outpatient, physician office, et cetera, where we can get a little bit more specific in understanding that holistic view of the patient journey. All right, and I picked up a question that is, um, how have we incorporated patient utilization data to determine drive time um, in terms of how far patients are willing to drive to receive services? So there are you know, a couple of approaches for that. And I, one of them is, we have taken all of our primary care patients in our panels and we have mapped them to their office. And so we have an understanding there um, of how far patients are willing to travel. And so in our market, we talk about a drive time for our primary care patients being 23 minutes. And that means that 75% of the patients live within 23 minutes of, of their primary care provider. So it sort of doesn't answer that question, where do patients go to the doctor, where they live or where they work? But we have some concept there. But then when we start looking at other utilization, hospital or outpatient procedural, um, that obviously, because of privacy, we can only see that at a zip code level. But we start to look and say, okay, how far are patients coming in for this procedure at our hospital? And, and we get to understand some of that distribution there. Um, you know, we spent a lot of times that we opened a, a satellite emergency room and we found 
when we started looking at the patient origin, they were coming from a much greater distance than anything we'd ever seen in the market. Uh, you know, most of that ER utilization is in a very close vicinity, and so we found something different here, um, specifically around pediatrics in our children's hospitals. So we did further investigation to understand what was happening. So again, I think there's data there, the market's talking, it's giving you clues. A lot of times it's not coming back with a black and white answer, but it's certainly giving you some directional. And so we use that, um, those approaches to understand drive time. That's fascinating. Have you guys seen anything else come through? Any other questions? I think that's it so far. Hopefully we've addressed all of them. Did uh, oh, I just pull it up? So Chris, uh, I'm not sure if I addressed your question or not uh, about external sources, but so I'll quickly recap for what Baptist Health is using. It is sourcing through HSG of external all payer uh, claims and through uh, fee for service Medicare claims based data that's feeding share of care measurement for, for their organization. So we'll give, I guess, people one last chance if there's any additional questions uh, that need to come through. We have plenty of time if they do. If not, no worries. And as a reminder, everyone, you could uh, submit your questions by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom right hand of your screen. Uh, you could also use the chat and select all panelists if you want to direct them to the speakers. And there is there is one or two in the chat. Uh, I think you might have answered it, but just making sure if you want to double check that. I think we did. I know it's got a little telling question about the executive team, and I, I'm not sure that if I, full, I fully understand that question. Um, but again, we do sort of look at the available data to see how far patients are traveling on average. Um, and then understand, and I, you know, it may be hitting to, we have some more um, higher level services. We would think about the cancer center and the cancer program as being something that would attract for a greater distance. Um, so there we would do some more investigating if those were some of the goals. But again, we do look for any clues we can find in, in the available data. And then, uh, and, DJ, yeah, please. We have one more for you, it's saying, Similar to the physician or to share of care, what's the source of tracking for the physician referrals? Sure, that's in turn, it is generated by our primary care offices. They are tracking their referrals and where they go. Um, and so then that rolls up. And what's interesting is that's a very, um, it's, an, it's an older measure than the, the share of care. Um, but it kind of, that question is asked often in meetings, and, and that team knows the answers. They know what we're doing in, in say, the orthopedic service line. They can tell you how many referrals are made in a year, what percent stay in the system. Um, and then, like I say, they can drill down by individual office or physician to understand in those patterns at that level. But that's internal, it's, it's maintained by our primary care offices. Yeah, and so, and the one of the piece I'll add to that, Chris, is that, so that, that's how Baptist Health is measuring their um, in-network in capture. We see a lot of organizations, especially as we think about share of care and the patient retention piece together, actually utilizing that same claims-based data source to do both of those measures so that we know those metrics are tied together where we can understand share of care is gonna be the total utilization uh, from a healthcare spend for that patient where the physician re referral piece or in inferred patient relationship piece can then put time stamps on those relationships where maybe we wanna say patient seen within our primary care office we're going to follow those patients for a determined time frame, maybe a 30 day window and understand where are they going for their specialty services. So there are ways to be able to kind of have those tied together um, and come from one single data source if that's where your organization uh, would like to go. So maybe give one more minute for any last minute questions that come in.
So if none, I guess I'll, I'll kind of wrap up. Just once again, I want to thank Max and Chad specifically for giving of their, their time and their resources, especially I, I hope that everyone that joined today found their insights valuable. We think it's always beneficial to hear. We as consultants obviously give the theory of what we think is best practice, but seeing how organizations are actually trying to execute on a lot of these things, I always find to be valuable. So I want to thank them specifically for joining us today. Thank you, Shishmed, for um, allowing us to kind of host this session. And then if there's, once again, if there's any, the post webinar survey that comes up, if you'd like a recording of uh, this session, a PDF version to share with your team, whatever it may be, then please make sure to fill out the, uh, the content in that post webinar survey, and we'll try to get it to you as quickly as possible. Thank you. A big thank you to DJ Max and Chad for sharing your expertise today. And another thank you to HSG for sponsoring today's program. A recording of this webinar will be shared via email later today. And so that concludes today's presentation. Please be sure to complete that short survey that DJ talked about. Uh, it'll pop up in your browser as soon as this webinar closes. So thank you everyone and wishing you all a great afternoon ahead. Thank you all. Thanks, Max and Chad. Thanks, DJ. I guess.